Hi there, I'm Kathleen Jasper, and today we're going to be talking about the Praxis 5005, which is the science section of the Elementary Education 5001 test. We have a brand new study guide out that covers this. The 5005 requires you to kind of memorize some of those old science concepts you might not have seen in the last 20 years. We're going to go over a few today. Let's get started. Okay, so the 5005, which is the science portion of the multiple subjects, is going to be a little bit easier, in my opinion, than the English language arts and the math. This science section really can be conquered by memorizing most of the science concepts we have and reviewing most of the science concepts we have in the book. This is is something you may not have seen in the last 20, 30 years. If you haven't been in a science classroom for a long time, there are going to be things on photosynthesis, rock formations, open circulatory systems versus closed circulatory systems, atoms, things like that. And there will be a little bit about the scientific method, which we will go over today. But some of these concepts may seem difficult because you just haven't seen them in a while. So we're going to go over them today, but make sure you get some study material. Obviously, I recommend our book, but make sure you review these concepts before taking the elementary education exam, because these will stump you if you have forgotten these concepts. Let's hop over to my presentation so I can show you what I'm talking about. All right. So the first section on the science test is the earth space science section. This is going to have to do with the earth's crust, rocks, planets, moon, sun, all of that. Let's have a look at this question here. This type of rock was originally liquid below the earth's crust and is formed by lava and magma. Okay. So this is types of rock question and we have sedimentary, igneous, metamorphic, and fossils. Well, rocks that are formed by lava and magma are igneous rocks. This is something you may not have thought about in a long time, but sedimentary rocks are formed by sediment kind of being pushed together and forming a rock. Metamorphic rocks are formed by heat and pressure. They're kind of crystal crystally type rocks and fossils are remnants or imprints of or living organisms embedded in the rock. So it's not fossils. Igneous is from lava and magma. Make sure you review your types of rocks before you take this exam. Let's have a look at another Earth's space science question. So we have the answer choices here. We have Earth's revolution, Earth's tilts, Earth's position, and Earth's distance. Let's go through the question. Mr. Lopez is teaching a unit on seasons. Well, right away, this should bring me to tilt on the axis because the Earth tilt on the axis causes seasons, but let's read the whole question. He explained why summer days are longer and winter days are shorter. What would Mr. Lopez emphasize regarding earth when explaining this phenomenon? Well, it's definitely the tilt on the axis. The tilt on the earth's axis is what causes seasons because we are tilted towards the sun during the summer months. Our summer days are longer. We have more sun exposure. In fact, up at the North Pole, they will have 24 hours of sun during some days during the summer. It's really weird if you ever look it up. It's just the sun kind of spinning around the sky. It's very crazy. And down at the bottom of the earth or the South Pole, when the North Pole is tilted towards the sun, they are experiencing winter. So in the Southern Hemisphere, winter months are during our summer months here in the Northern Hemisphere. Um, and they will have much shorter days. And then subsequently, as the Earth uh, revolves around the sun, the bottom of the Earth then becomes tilted towards the sun. So they experience summer. And then we in the Northern Hemisphere, when we're tilted away from the sun, experience shorter days, less sun sunlight, in fact. Act, up at the North Pole during the winter months, they will have 24 hours of nighttime darkness. So make sure you understand that the Earth's tilt has to do with seasons. You will most likely have a question like this on the exam. All right, let's have a look at life science here. So this is going to be about plants, cells, ecosystems, circulatory systems, anything about living organisms on earth. Okay. So let's have a look at the answer choices first, because they're pretty long and I might be able to eliminate. And I can see this is jumping out at me. Choose all that apply. All right. Let's have a look at the first one. Plant cells use oxygen and water to make food while animal cells use ATP from carbon dioxide and sugar. Well, this is sort of correct, but not completely correct. Plants do not use oxygen. Plants actually use carbon dioxide. Animals use oxygen. So this has it kind of flipped backwards. Animal cells do use ATP. ATP. Plant cells do make their own food, but 
the oxygen and the carbon dioxide is making this incorrect. Let's have a look at the second box. Plant cells use carbon dioxide, water, and sunlight. Yes, they do to make their own food. Check. While animal cells make ATP from glucose and oxygen. Yes, we are going to choose this box. Remember, plant cells go through photosynthesis where they take carbon dioxide, water, and sunlight, and they turn that into glucose and oxygen, which animals then take in and turn that into ATP, which gives us energy. So it's a symbiotic relationship. So make sure you understand which system goes with what organism. Let's go with the next one. Animal cells go through photosynthesis right away. I can cross that off. Animal cells do not go through photosynthesis. Animal cells go through cellular respiration. Plant cells go through photosynthesis. So the third box is incorrect. Let's look at the fourth box. Plant cells go through photosynthesis. Yes. While animal cells go through cellular respiration. Yes. So the second and the fourth box are correct. Again, this is something you might want to review if you haven't thought about this in a long time. All right, let's do another life science question. I can see here that we're talking about plants. And if you understand science, you have red versus white. We're talking about recessive versus dominant traits. Let's have a look at the question. Red plants have a dominant trait for color, capital R, while white plants have the recessive trait for color, small r. How many red plants and white plants are produced when plants that have one red, one white, by another plant that has one red, one white are crossed. Okay, so if you know genetics very well, you can easily grab this question. You know that it's going to be A. But for those of you who don't remember, let's do a quick Punnett square. And you probably haven't done a Punnett square in a long time, but we're going to just divide this into four boxes. This is an easy Punnett square. You will not have to do very, very complicated ones. So let's put the first organism at the top. We have big R, little r. This plant is showing red because it does have the dominant R trait. The little r is covered up by the big R. Then we have another plant with the same alleles, big R, little r. So now we're going to cross. So in this box here, we're crossing this big R and this big R, and we get two dominant red red traits. That's definitely going to be a red plant. Then we have this little r and this big r, which gives us big r, little r, which is going to show red, but we still have that recessive allele, but it's going to produce a red plant. Then we do the same thing here, little r, big r right there. And we have a red plant. All three of these are red plants. But then in the last one, we cross these two and we're going to get little r, little r. When you cross um, a two organisms with one recessive and one dominant like we have here, there's a 25% chance that you will receive the recessive uh, traits, both recessive traits and show that. So in this case, we're going to have three red plants and one white plant because these three plants all have the dominant R. So that's what's going to show. Even though they have the recessive R, they're still going to show the red. The only time they're going to show the white is when they've inherited both recessive alleles. That only happens in one box or 25% of the time. A is the correct answer. All right, let's move on to physical science. So this is going to be anything about atoms, energy, small machines, uh, properties of water, things like that. All right, let's have a look at the answer choices. Water boiling on a stove, plants sucking water up through their roots, water droplets forming on the outside of a surface, and a puddle disappearing. Okay, let's look at the question. During which of the following is condensation occurring? Well, water boiling on the stove is not condensation. That is vaporization. The water turns into vapor, steam. So A is out. B, plant sucking water up through their roots. That is actually transpiration. When plants uh, use their roots to suck water from the soil, that's transpiration. That is not what we're talking about here. And it's actually a life science thing. So that doesn't fit. See water droplets forming on the outside of a surface. Yes, indeed. When you have a glass of ice water and you leave it out for just a minute or two, you will notice those droplets on the outside of the ice water. That is condensation. And D, a puddle disappearing on a hot day, that is evaporation. So these are all properties of water, except for B. B is a, is a plant quest, uh, plant answer choice. And if you understand that we're in physical science, you could have immediately eliminated B, but C is going to be the best answer here. 
All right, let's do one more physical science question. And this looks to me like we're talking about energy. We've got this guy skiing down a hill. So let's have a look here. At what point on the graphic below is potential energy the highest? All right, remember, we have two types of energy, potential and kinetic. Well, when we are at the top of the hill, getting ready, having the potential to go down the hill, the potential energy is highest at the top. So A is going to be the correct answer. Now, it may ask you what point of the graphic is kinetic energy the highest. If we were asking about kinetic energy, that would be D. That happens right before the hill kind of flattens out and slows you down. So D would be the highest kinetic energy, but it is asking us about potential. And think about it. If I were to drop this pencil from up here, it has much higher potential energy than if I bring it down here and drop it, right? So whatever the highest starting point it can be, that is going to be the highest potential energy. And finally, let's have a look at the scientific method. I'm just going to have you guys look at these questions here. What is the independent variable? What is the dependent variable? What is the control? And what would make this experiment stronger? So this is not a multiple choice question, but I wanted to go over this because we need to make sure we understand the scientific method and experiments when we're answering questions, because you will probably get one of these questions on the exam. So let's have a look at the scenario here. Ms. Jasper's fourth grade class is studying plants. They experimented to see if brand name fertilizer helps plants grow taller than the generic brand. So they're testing fertilizer, brand name or generic. They have three of the same types of plants. All of the plants are in the same size container, have the same amount of soil and receive the same amount of sunlight and water. Okay. Because why would we do that? Well, you want, we're testing fertilizer here. So we don't want to give one plant more sunlight than another or one more water than another, because then you can't determine if it's actually the fertilizer that's having the effect on the plant. Okay. So when we do experiments, we keep these things constant. We want to make sure the buckets that they're in are the same. The sunlight is the same. The temperature is the same. The water is the same. Everything is the same, 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 except for one thing, which is the fertilizer we're administering to the plant. One plant receives the brand name fertilizer. One plant receives the generic fertilizer and one plant receives no fertilizer. Okay. Three plants, one gets the generic, one gets the brand name and one gets no fertilizer. Everything else remains the same. Okay. So then what is the independent variable? The independent variable is the thing the scientist does to the experiment. In this case, the fertilizer or lack of fertilizer is the independent variable. It is the treatment. So that is the thing that's going to affect the experiment. Now, remember, in order to make sure that it is indeed the fertilizer having the effect on the plant, we have to make sure everything else is constant. But in this case, the independent variable is the treatment or the fertilizer. If you were testing drugs, the drug would be the independent variable. If you were testing temperature, high temperatures doing something to an enzyme or something like that, the independent variable would be the temperature. So it's anything that the scientist is manipulating. In this case, it's the fertilizer. Well, then what is the dependent variable? Well, the dependent variable is the effect or the result. So the difference in growth in plant would be the, the dependent variable. So for example, let's say that the brand name fertilizer plant shot way up and the other two were kind of left, you know, not so, not so high. Well, the distance in growth would be the dependent variable. The plant that received the brand name fertilizer was three inches taller than the other plant that received the brand name or the, the generic name. So that would be the dependent variable is the growth in the plant or lack thereof. Sometimes your dependent variable is a dud. There is no movement. And then three, what is the control? Now the control is the plant that received no fertilizer. Why is it important to have a control? Well, it helps to verify the experiment because you could just have the brand name and you could have the generic name and you're measuring the distances and growth, you know, the, the how much more one grew than the other. But when you have a control, it gives more validity to the experiment. Because let's say that 
the control, the plant that had no fertilizer whatsoever, that one could have shot up and been taller than the generic and the brand name. So a control just helps us to understand the, the dependent variable a little bit better and to have a baseline of, you know, what's going on in the experiment. The baseline being no fertilizer in this experiment. And then what would make this uh, experiment stronger? Well, for this particular experiment, what would make it stronger is more plants, right? We're just testing three plants here, one with brand name, one with generic and one without. If we had more plants and we had like a whole room full of plants and we had all of the brand names, all, like 20 brand name fertilized plants, 20 um generic fertilized plants and 20 control plants, no fertilizer at all, we would be able to conduct a better experiment because the experiment is dealing with a larger sample size so we can make better generalizations here. Because what could happen? Well, the brand name fertilizer could have been a fluke, right? It could have made the plant grow really tall, but it could have been a fluke. If we have more than one plant, in this case, 20 of each, we would be able to understand the results much better. So a larger sample size is always going to be the best bet. Sometimes adding a control makes the experiment stronger. So let's say that we had no control. Let's say that we didn't have the no fertilizer plant. Let's say that that was not part of the question. What would make this experiment stronger? First thing would be add a control. Second thing would be make the sample size bigger. And then another thing that would make it even stronger is to replicate the experiment over and over and over again. Remember, you might get the result and then you might replicate the experiment and get completely different results. So scientists are constantly doing the experiments over and over and over again so they can generalize about results that way as well. All right. So I hope that helped you today. These are just a few questions in our 5005 book. Let me show you where to get this book if you are interested in buying our resources. All right. To get our resources, just navigate to KathleenJasper.com. We'll put the link in the description. You can go over here to study guides, elementary education, and we have all of our elementary education study guides. You can get the full study guide if you need all four subtests. But if you just need the science, you can just go ahead and grab the science portion of the book. But if you need more than one, let's say you need the social studies and science, it is more cost effective just to buy the entire book. Now, if you would like more support when we're talking about science or anything, you can head over to our Praxis 5001 online course. You can also buy this by subtest. And you will see that our Praxis Elementary Education Science is very comprehensive. You can see over here on the left-hand menu, there are all kinds of things that we're doing here. Um, it also comes with the brand new digital study guide. You download it here and you can save it to your computer. So you do get the full study guide when you buy the online course. And as we go through this, you can see that there are just tons of of visuals and information. I have videos that go through every single piece of the exam. There are activities, different things, you know, to, to have a look at. I have visual activities, slides to go with each presentation. And then of course, there is a post test at the end that's given digitally. So you can be prepared for what that's going to be like on the test. Again, you get the digital study guide when you get the online course. So you don't do not have to buy both when you buy the online course. I'll link everything up in the description below. Let me know if you have any questions and it will be my pleasure to help. Have an awesome day.